Yeah, okay, so let me take, this is what I'm gonna to do today, but I'm gonna come back to that. So, so let me tell you a little bit about the course before we get going in today's lecture. Um, so when Jim and I were, were thinking about this, um, you know, we sort of thought about some themes, if you will, that um, uh, time series econometricians have been thinking about um, over the last decade or 15 years or so, right? And, and one thing is, um, you know, there's been a lot of work and a lot of interest in sort of low frequency variability, sort of obvious things, sort of unit roots, co-integration, fractional stuff, all, all of that. But, so it shows up there, but, but you know, it also shows up in, in models of instability when you've got time variation and parameters and some structure. Um, it shows up if you're interested in thinking about stochastic volatility, macroeconomists thinking about great moderations or things like that, worry about that kind of low frequency variability now in variances instead of means, but it turns out to be the same kind of problem. Um, you know, we want to do inference, so we, we need to, you know, use, uh, you know, hack standard errors, right? And um, the same kind of issues show up there. And of course, the, you know, issue of long run identification and structural vector autoregression. So all of these are sort of low frequency things. So we want to, we want to talk about um, those. Um, the other thing is, you know, econometrics, if you will, is all about identification, which makes econometrics, I guess, different than statistics. Um, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, um, and, and so there's been, you know, really lots of work, you know, in understanding um, inference in um, uh, situations where you have weak instruments. And, and so, uh, you know, Jim is kind of one of the guys uh, in that. And so, so he's going to spend some time this afternoon um, talking about that. Um, and then, of course, you know, a sort of a standard, if you will, topic in, in time series is forecasting. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. There have been some sort of new techniques for, if you will, thinking about um, evaluating or assessing forecasts. So those are kind of the main topics. You know, some tools that, um, some of you are familiar with, all of you are familiar with some of these, um, some of you are familiar with all of them, but the, the sort of key tools, you know, we've sort of listed here, you know, standard stuff, VAR, central limit theorems, filters, spectra, right? Those are all sort of standard tools, you know, tools that may be sort of less familiar, sort of empirical process stuff, functional central limit theorems, um, and simulation methods, if you will, MCMC or bootstrap kinds of things, are maybe a little less familiar. And so we'll blend in these tools uh, in the context of, you know, the particular sort of substantive problems um, that we're going to talk about. Um, this isn't going to, uh, this isn't going to be a survey. Uh, so if we don't talk about your work, don't, don't get mad. <laughs> Or you can get mad, just don't get vocal, you know, so. Uh, okay, so, um, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, you've probably seen the outline. So, so today, this is, if you will, sort of, I don't know, what's new in time series econometrics. We're going to start with what's old. So the first lecture probably is, is like 1960s, right? And, and, and that's to, uh, that's because some, some of the stuff from the 60s was pretty good, you know. Like Woodstock. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're going to do. And, and Granger and Hadnaga was good. So that's what we're going to do. That's a classic book. So that's what we're going to do. Initially, I'm going to talk about uh, some frequency domain stuff. And again, this is, this is sort of old stuff. But um, we're going to be using these concepts later on in, in lots of other stuff. So it's important that we sort of, um, you know, review them. So that's what's going to be. Uh, today's first lecture. Um, and then I'll, uh, the second lecture is um, I'll talk about the functional central limit theorem and start talking about um, low frequency variability in relationships, and that's going to be structural breaks. I'll talk about testing um, there, and uh, the testing problem um, uh, turns out to rely on this FCLT, functional central limit theorem stuff. And then Jim's going to come in this afternoon and do weak and mini instruments. Um, and then tomorrow, um, again, I'll be here in the morning, and I'm going to do um, filtering, uh, linear filtering and nonlinear filtering, 
and if you will, the, you know, the new tool there will be some Markov chain Monte Carlo stuff to, as one way to do some nonlinear filtering. So you'll learn a little bit about that. The application, there'll be a few applications, but probably the application that I'll spend the most time on is a stochastic volatility thing and looking at changes in the variance of inflation and output or something, right? So we'll think about that turns out to be a nonlinear filtering problem, or you can cast it as a nonlinear filtering problem. So we'll think about you know, how you might solve that. Um, and then I'll finish up this um, stochastic time variation stuff um, in my second lecture, and I'll talk about uh, time varying parameter models. I'll introduce those today. Um, and then Jim will come in the afternoon, and he'll do uh, uh, structural vector autoregressions um, in 90 minutes. And then he'll do um, all of DSGE econometrics in 90 minutes. OK, so uh, that's fine. He's got the hard stuff. And then, um, and then I'll do uh, on Wednesday, for those of you that are still here, um, I'll, do, uh, I'll do hack and, um, and talk a little bit more about um, low frequency modeling. Um, and I'll do forecast assessment. Um, and then Jim will come and talk about models where you have, uh, you know, you're doing time series, you're, you know, it's a time series model, so you've got a long time series, but you also have a zillion variables that you're looking at, right? So um, large N and large T issues, he'll do some dynamic factor models. That's one example of that, but he'll do some, don't, some other stuff as well. So that'll be the afternoon. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, the, the way we sort of plan on, planned on doing this was you would have these slides in front of you, and um, hopefully, uh, maybe with the exception of this lecture, um, that will be um, the way things are realized. Um, uh, the, um, we're revising these slides sort of in real time as we look at them and prepare these lectures, and we will correct typos and stuff you know, over the next few days. So. Uh, slides will be uh, posted on the NBR website, but probably not until like next Monday or something when we've taken out, at least in my case, the like really stupid things that are in these. So if you see really stupid things, tell me, because once you post it, then you're dead. Um, uh, there'll be a, there's lots of references because even though this isn't a survey, you know, you want, we want to tell you guys where to, you might want to look some stuff up, right? And um, in my cases, the list of references will be available Wednesday. Jim has his references organized by lecture. I have mine all thrown in one file, and I'm still working on my lectures. So uh, mine will be available Wednesday. Jim's will be available every day, right? So for those of you that don't get enough econometrics from 8 to 5 and want to read in the evening, you can um, go to Jim's thing. Um, level of the course, I wanted to mention this. You know, the... the um, this is a real diverse group, um, and uh, they were like experts here. Some of them are sitting here, uh, and I've told them not to shake their heads when I say something stupid. Um, but uh, there's another one. God, okay. Anyway, uh, so, and I've said I'm not talking to you guys, okay? Um, so the. I'm talking to someone else. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, so the level is not going to be is is not going to be uh, Anna. Um, uh, it, it's going to be someone else. Okay, uh, questions. Um, so this is like a big course. So in terms of you know, um, uh, I was supposed to say here, um, you know, clarifying questions. Please ask. I mean, like something's wrong in the slides, which you have in front of you. You're supposed to pretend you have the slides in front of you and gross typos, point those out so we don't get confused as, as we sort of go through this. Um, more uh, broader questions about, you know, how does this relate to my research? Um, probably, um, you know, it's best to postpone those f until, you know, beers or coffee. Um, uh, at the break. I think there's only coffee at the break, actually, not beer. <laughs> um, but we'll need some beer later. Uh, okay. So, um, so that's it. So let, let me now go back to what I'm going to do today. These are a little out of order. Uh, introduction to the course, of course. 
Um, I'm going to go through um, sort of just some basic jargon real quickly, just to remind, just so that we're all um, together, what basic jargon is, and, and then I'm going to move into talking about um, some uh, frequency domain stuff. Um, again, from the 1960s, um, you know, the um, applications of this, or what makes this useful now, are are a couple of things. Um, People do filter data. They use, you know, HP filters or bandpass filters or these filters or those, you know, seasonal adjustment filters, right? And it's sort of important, you know, you, you learned this in graduate school, but maybe you've forgotten this, right? It's important to sort of realize, you know, what those things, those transformations are doing to the data, right? So I'm going to remind you of that, and we'll go through that kind of carefully, right? It's a reminder, but again, I'm going through it carefully. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe the application will be we'll talk a little bit more about bandpass filters than other filters just because you have to talk about something. And as an example, that's something kind of fun to talk about. But what, what I will talk about there will apply to um, other filter, linear filters as well. And then we'll talk about the issue of, you know, what if you want to use one of these things in real time? You want to estimate an output gap in real time. An output gap is, you know, you filter the data to, to find a trend, right? And you subtract it from the series, and that's an output gap, right? And suppose you want to do that in real time, right? You want to know what the output gap is in, you know, the second quarter of, you know, 2008. Well, we'll see if you look at these filters, these sort of optimal filters, they're two-sided. You know, they require the future and the past to figure out what the value of the trend is today. That kind of makes sense, but, you know, that's useful if you're doing historical analysis, but if you're doing real-time analysis, right, it isn't useful. So the question is, how do you modify these two-sided things so that they work as well as possible in a one-sided world where you only have data up to the present? Right? You don't have future data. And it turns out that it's kind of trivially easy to do that. So I'll show you that. Right? And it's also sort of trivially easy to figure out uh, how much uncertainty there is in that. The fact that you only used one side of the data instead of two sides, how big, how much uncertainty is there around, around the current output gap. So as the application of this 1960s spectral stuff, we'll think about, if you will, output gap measurement in real time and variability of output gaps. Okay? Um, uh, most of this stuff will be univariate and indeed when I teach anyway, most of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is, uh, is uh, simple examples and because simple examples get the main idea across or get many of the main ideas across. And uh, in, in this case, the simple example is going to be looking at one series, and you can get many of the main ideas across, right? except you can't get correlations across series across when you're looking at one series. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about you know, the extension of this to um, more than one series multivariate spectra. And of course, that's just instead of a variance looking at a covariance matrix, and that's got a bunch of variances in it, but it's got some covariances. Okay, So that's all that is. Okay, and then I'll say a few words about spectral estimation, but not much because it turns out that this will be exactly the problem that we want to study when we think about um, estimating um, hack covariance matrices, hack standard errors. Turns out, as we will see, and as many of you know, it's exactly the same problem. We're going to spend, you know, an entire lecture on that. So here I'll just wave my hands and say we're going to do it later. Okay? Okay. Blah, 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 blah. OK. So you've got these slides in front of you, so we can go through this. Um, so these are just words, I guess, and letters, subscripts, some little colons and stuff. Uh, and uh, so um, I just want to, OK, so here's some stuff you know. Um, yt is going to denote a sequence of random variables. So it's uh, going to be a sequence of random variables generated by some probability law or described by some probability law. So, you know, the word, when you've got a sequence of random variables, the word that you use to describe the probability law is a stochastic process. 
A realization is a sample of size one. In this case, right, that's one draw from the stochastic process. So you get a whole bunch of Ys. Um, I'll probably be schizophrenic about capital Y and little y in the lectures. Uh, but here it's important to draw the distinction between the random variable and a realization. Stationary stochastic processes are st stochastic processes where that are stationary. <laughs> and that's what that is. Um, you know this stuff, OK. But again, I just want to have it all on the record, if you will. Autocovariances are autocovariances, so the covariance between yt and yt k periods in the future. Um, Autocorrelations are those. Covariance stationary if the autocovariances and stuff, first and second moments, don't depend on time. So you can get rid of the time subscripts. White noise is white noise which I always pause because sometimes you can hear it, right? Can you guys hear it? Shh. Yeah, you can, right? Eh, almost. Anyway, it comes from, the, comes from up there, right? <laughs> OK, uh, right, it's that sound, right? So that's, um, that's a, a process, uh, a covariance stationary process, which has mean 0 and um, no autocovariances. Um, a martingale, right, is, is uh, you know, like a random walk in that uh, your best guess of y at day t plus 1 is y at day t, conditional on some information set that includes y and that grows. A martingale difference process is just the difference of one of these y's, so your best guess of a martingale difference, right, is, of course, a 0. A uh, lag operator, you know, L times Y, L is, is this operator that operates on sequences, shifts all elements in the sequence back by one period. L2 denotes L operated, operated on the sequence twice, so you shift it back two periods. You know, if B is a constant, you can interchange B and L. Linear filter, so we'll talk about these. So when I use the word linear filter, I just mean a moving average. Right? So moving average, um, here's this uh, moving average filter, right? So it's, I'm going to denote it by C of L. So what it is is if X is C of L of Y, it's a moving average of the elements of Y in the past and in the future, right, where uh, these C's are weights. So these C's are just constants like 2, 14 numbers like that. Um, and then um, if you take uh, y can be a filtered version of, um, of white noise in, in a couple of different ways, um, right? Sort of famous ways are in a difference equation way, like an autoregression, or just as a simple moving average as in a, in a moving average process. So, so I'll typically use phi for AR polynomial and theta for MA polynomials, and I always put minus signs in here. Most of the world puts minus signs in here, except I think rats. Does rats put minus signs in? I think you, anyway, I don't know. I hate that program. <laughs> don't tell them that. OK, uh, and then you can put these things together. So that's this. OK, now. Um, So this is familiar, right? So this is the Wold decomposition theorem, right? The Wold decomposition theorem says, um, basically, if you have a covariant stationary process, basically, right, um, uh, you can represent it as a long moving average, right? Where these uh, epsilon shocks are the one step ahead um, forecast errors of y constructed um, using um, constructed using a linear forecasting rule where um, uh, the forecast is linear and lagged values of y. So epsilons that have this property, they're one step ahead forecast errors from some data that you observe, right? Those guys are called fundamental, right? So that's jargon, right? And Jim will come back and talk about like fundamental stuff when he talks about structural vector autoregressions because it arises there, or these structural errors, things that you can figure out by looking at current and past values of the data that you have, right? OK. So that's um, one famous decomposition, of course, that we, we all know, right? Another famous 
decomposition is, um, is a frequency domain decomposition, um, you know, sometimes called the Cramer representation instead of the Wold representation. Um, sometimes it's written as the spectral representation theorem. Um, you can see it in lots of places. Brockwell and Davis is, is one. And um, we're going to spend some time talking about this, right? It says, um, right, going back here, you take, y, you take y and you break it up into a whole bunch of little pieces, these epsilons. Each of these pieces corresponds, each of these pieces is uncorrelated with one another. These epsilons are uncorrelated with one another. And each of them, and they're homoscedastic, right? They all have variants, sigma epsilon squared, right? Um, and they have time associated with them, right? So epsilon t minus 2 is the forecast error that you made at time t minus 2, right? So they depend on time, right? This um, is another decomposition. You're going to take x, right? You're going to break it into a whole bunch of uncorrelated pieces, right? These pieces now um, are going to be called z's, right? Or z are going to be called z's, right? And um, each of these pieces is now going to correspond to a particular frequency, right? So you're going to have a low frequency component and a high frequency component, a business cycle frequency component. All of these different components are going to be strictly periodic. I'm going to go through this in great detail. Are going to be strictly periodic. They're going to be uncorrelated with one another. And importantly, they're going to have different variances, right? So one component corresponding to the business cycle might have big variance. So that's going to be then if you, if you generated a realization from that process, it's got a big business cycle Z, so you're going to see a big business cycle, right? Another process is going to have a big low frequency component. If you generate a realization from that, it's going to look very trendy, right? Because that, that component's going to be important. So we're going to spend really the, the rest of uh, this first lecture this morning um, you know, talking about this, okay? Okay, so here's some data. Um, so this is um, housing starts or building permits. And it's pretty cool. I mean, your eye kind of, of course, goes to right to here, but um, that, was not the, uh, that was not the reason that I uh, chose this. Um, I chose this because it, um, you know, it's got all this interesting action in it, okay? So we're going to think about um, some describing this action and do, doing some other things to try and isolate certain bits of this, right? So if you see this, if you look at this, well, what do you see? Well, well it kind of really doesn't have much of a trend in it, right? That's kind of interesting because this isn't differenced or detrended or anything. This is just thousands of units, okay? But, okay? Who, who would have known? Um, it's got, well, some business cycle stuff in it, right? It's got, it's got that, right? So it almost looks like a business cycle. Remember, there was this that didn't happen to housing, and that was kind of interesting, right? But we're making up for it now. <laughs> uh, so it's got this sort of business cycle variability to it, right? Um, you know, it also, of course, you know, not surprisingly, you know, has important jiggles and jaggles, right? And those jiggles and jaggles are, this is monthly data, these jiggles and jaggles are, of course, seasonals, right? I mean, you don't build a lot of houses in January, you build more in July, right? So, so all of this stuff, right, is the seasonal variation in the series, okay? So what are we going to try and do, or what's this sort of spectral stuff all about, right? you know, again, as, as you know, as you learned, but, you know, it was review, right? It's, it's sort of thinking about the series as being composed of, you know, there's the business cycle bit, there's the seasonal bit, there's the low frequency bit, and let's do some calculations to see if we can figure out, you know, how, what's the relative importance of those different contributions, right? And then the filtering exercise is going to be, can we do something to this series to highlight a particular component, right? So can we do something to just extract the seasonal bit? Why might we want to do that? Because we might want to throw it away, right? And that's called seasonal adjustment, right? 
or we might want to just look at the business cycle component, right? So that would be some sort of, you know, business cycle band pass filtered thing, right? So that's what we're going to talk about doing. And then, right, when we talk about real time stuff, we'll ask about, gee, if you were doing that stuff in real time, you know, how would you, how would you be, what would you be uh, thinking about down here? You'd be, holy moly is what you'd be thinking, huh? Okay. Okay, so this must be just what I said. So I don't teach with slides. So when you have slides up there, I keep like looking, right, and thinking I have to read these, but I don't have to read these, right? I can just speak and then you can read these, okay? So undoubtedly I've said this stuff. Fine, okay. One thing that's going to be interesting that I, I, I didn't, I mentioned, but this low frequency variability, right? That's what hack is all about, right? That's what robust standard errors are all about in regressions, right? So um, we're going to think a lot about, um, you know, uh, how do we estimate the spectrum, which is the variance component of the very low frequency bits, because that's going to tell us the variability of sample averages, as it turns out, right? And I'll, I'll show you that calculation. And again, most of you have seen that. Okay, so, um, so now what I want to do is, you know, we, we had this Cramer representation, the spectral representation, Y dependent on these Zs with this integral thing, okay? So I want to show you where that comes from, okay? And it takes about two slides, and then there's some slides of calculations that are not interesting, but I put them in here to make this look, to fill the pages, okay? Uh, so um, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to show you uh, like four, four equations, right? Four processes, four models for why. I'm going to start with something really simple and then move to something just slightly less simple. And then basically we're done, OK? So here's the simplest, here's the simplest y process, right? It's just yt is the cosine of omega t. Right? So it just looks like, I think it looks like this. I remember this from high school. Right? I think it looks like, I think it looks something like that. Right? It just, and it keeps doing that forever. Right? Um, and a couple of things about it, it um, it's repeats itself, right? And it repeats itself exactly right every, um, 2 pi over omega time periods, right? So if omega is really big, high frequency, this thing's repeating itself quite often, right? And if omega is very small, it repeats itself. Um, it takes a long time to repeat itself. So omega is frequency, low frequencies are low frequencies, okay? The thing about this thing is I've written here, it's sort of, I, well, I kind of got it wrong. It, you know, starts at one, it starts at one, right, and it has an amplitude of one. So this is a pretty boring process, right? You might want to spice it up a little bit, right? How could you spice it up a little bit? Well, you could change omega, we'll do that, right? Um, or, you know, you could make it start right here. You could shift the origin, right? And maybe you could squish it, right? It's attenuation, or make it bigger, right? That's amplifying, right? So how could you do that? Well, a simple way to do that, right, or one way to do that, right, is just to, you know, add a sine term. Make it a weighted average of a cosine term and a sine term, right, with weights A and B, right? And then the initial value is now A, right? And the amplitude is now the square root of A squared plus B squared, okay? So A and B are getting the initial condition right and changing the amplitude. Okay, so that's fine, right, but this is, there's nothing random here, right? So let's make this a stochastic process, right? One way to make this a stochastic process is just to think about these weights, A and B, as random variables, right? So, so that's exactly what this spectral stuff is all about, right? So now same thing, except uh, A and B are random variables. They have mean zero, right? They're uncorrelated with one another. So A and B are uncorrelated with one another, and they have the same variance, sigma squared. Okay, so that's just a process I just made up. Okay, 
From that, right, well, what can you do? Well, you could figure out, you know, what's the mean of y? Well, it's the mean of a times this plus the mean of b times that. The mean of a and b are both 0, so this y has variance, has a mean 0. What's its variance? Well, you know, variance of this plus variance of this plus 2 times covariance. Covariance is 0, right? So I get, you know, sigma squared times cosine squared plus sigma squared times sine squared. And then in high school, you learn cosine squared and sine squared adds to 1, right? So you get the variance of sigma squared, right? And you could work out the covariance is 2. Right? And it turns out it looks sigma squared times the cosine of omega k, right? So if, if I set k is equal to 0, right, just as a check, I get the cosine of 0, and that's 1. So that means I didn't do any obvious mistake in my calculation. Okay? So this is about all you need to know for spectral analysis is this equation, is this process. Okay? So what are we going to do now? Well, we're just going to. We're going to take a bunch of these guys and add them together. Okay, so now let's go here. Okay, so this is the same thing, right? Except we're going to take these process that I just had. That was for one omega, right? Like a seasonal, right? Now let's take another business cycle guy and add to it. You know, another high frequency guy, add to it. Another low frequency guy, right? So that maybe gives us six components, right? So let's do the same thing, right, for here I've written, I guess, as n components. But think of n as being equal to six. Business cycle, seasonal, low frequency, and then we'd need three more, OK? And um, let's let uh, these a's and b's be just like they were before. They are uncorrelated with one another across all frequencies. But now let's make this a little more interesting. Let's make the seasonal component more important than the business cycle component. What does that mean? Well, I want the A's and B's for the seasonal thing bigger than the A's and B's for the business cycle thing. OK? But these A's and B's are random variables, so what does it mean to be bigger, right? Well, it means probabilistically they're going to be bigger, right? So we'll just give the seasonal, the seasonal A's and B's bigger variance, right? So then if we generate a realization of that, chances are those A's and B's would be bigger. The series would be dominated by its seasonal component, right? So this is just a decomposition, if you will, where you've got heteroscedasticity, where the heteroscedasticity is frequency related, OK? You can work out, well, what's the mean of this? The mean is 0. What's the variance? Well, this is a sum of a bunch of uncorrelated guys. The variance before in our simple process was sigma squared. Now it's a sum of these sigma squares, right, corresponding to each of these different frequencies. The autocovariances are also going to be a sum of the autocovariances that we saw before. OK? So this is a nice decomposition of variance and a decomposition of autocovariance. OK? Now, you know, I only put six components in here, right? What if we put in 60 or 600 or 6,000, right? Or as they say, six kazillion, right? If you put in six kazillion all frequencies, right? Well, you'd put in six kazillion, right? So you want to make n really big, right? And when you make n really big, right, that's like this. Right, you make n really big, you look at all frequencies, in this case, between 0 and pi. Okay, so I'm thinking about discrete time data, right? Data that you, I'm not thinking about data that you, I'm not thinking about data that you see continuously now. I'm thinking about data that you did see discreetly one month, the next month, the next month, right? And then it turns out you only need to go up to frequency pi for reasons that have to do with you guys know these stories, wagon wheels and movies and stuff, and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so, so this is just the same thing I had before, right? There's my A, there's my B, here's my sine and cosine term, right? I want these A's and B's to be uncorrelated with one another. I want them each to have a different variance where the variance depends on frequency. Okay, so that's it. Now that variance function, how variance depends on frequency, right, is this spectral density function. Right? So instead of, you know, I wrote before 
sigma squared j, where that was frequency, I could have written that as sigma squared omega, right? And just we're going to see in a second, I'm going to start calling that s of omega. And I don't know why, because this looks more natural. OK, OK, great. Oops, wrong way. Nope. OK, I'm going to skip these slides. OK, so here, here's, OK, so here's, a, here's an admission. I hate sines and cosines. I just hate them, right? And I can't do any, I can't do any calculations involving them except this. And you can see I got that wrong, right? So, so I want to write it in a different notation because I hate these things, OK? So when you see sines and cosines together, what do you think about if you hate them, right? You think, what if I wrote that as a complex exponential, e to the i something, right? e to the i something has cosine and sine in it, right? And e's are OK. Right? Differentiating an e, e to the something is easy, right? Differentiate a cosine. What do you get? You get either the sine or the minus the sine. I mean, right? It's confusing, right? So, <laughs> right? I, I, right, it is. OK, anyway. So I'm going to use, just to save myself making obvious mistakes, I'm going to convert this cosine and sine thing into something with a complex exponential because then I'm dealing with E's, right? So that's all this is, right? Instead of writing A cosine plus B sine, I can write this as E to the I omega times G plus E to the minus I omega times G complex, G conjugate, where G's are these things. Okay. And these slides are going to be given to you, so you don't have to write this down. I know. OK? So, so I know this doesn't look easier, but it's easier for me. So I'm going to drag you through this. OK? So, so you can do the same thing with all these other things. OK? So when I wrote down the spectral representation to begin with, the theorem, right? It said y was this <coughs> integral of it didn't have sines and cosines in it. It had e to the i omega t. This is just sines and cosines, right? Times these increments, these increments z are just this, these a's and b's, OK? And the variance of the a's and b's, right, we're going to denote by sigma squared omega or s omega. So that's going to be the variance of this dz process, OK? So, so that's what this is. Now later, OK, OK. And then you can work some stuff out, OK? So um, the stuff you can work out is easy, right? What's the expected value of y? Well, we saw it in the case where we just had six components. It was 0. What was the variance of y? The variance of y was the sum of the variances over the different frequencies, right? So we're going to want the same thing here, right? The sum is now going to be an integral. So gamma 0, gamma 0 is the 0th autocovariance. That's the variance, right? That's the integral of e to the i omega k. k is 0, so that's 1, right? This variance function added up, right? So that's just the sum of these sigma j squareds, right? And then we have the autocovariances. They had cosine stuff, right? That's what, that's what this is. That's what this is, the general formula, OK? And this just kind of does it. And that must be what this says, summarizing. Blah, blah, blah. You guys can read this. Read this to yourself. Can you, except in the back, where they should give binoculars. OK, so can you see it? How many fingers am I holding up? OK. OK, four? OK, cool. OK. Um, so this is a variance function. It's, it's the variance of the omega component corresponds to period 2 pi of omega. It's a variance, so it's got to be positive. So if you ever computed one of these and it was negative, you live in a weird world, or you made a mistake. Um, the way I did it here, it's symmetric. So it's typically plotted between um, 0 and pi. This symmetry may be important for something we do later, or may not be, but let me just say it. Um, 
the last slide, which I went through quickly, showed how I could get autocovariances from spectra. Another convenient thing is you take this and you muck around with it a little bit, right? And it turns out you could solve for this as a function of this, right? So just uh, do that, right? And that's what this is. So this is going to be useful because this says the spectrum can be written as a function of these autocovariances. And sometimes we know autocovariances, right? We know autocovariances, like for white noise, right? And then we can figure out its spectrum quite easy, right? So for a white noise process, right, all the autocovariances are zero. The spectrum is really boring. It doesn't have any omegas in it, right? It's flat, right? So that's why it's called white noise. It's got a flat spectrum. And that's why it makes that noise that you can't, now there's rumbling. That's not right. OK, anyway. OK, we're all, everyone's here. So we're up to about, now we're like in 1962. OK, not quite. OK, here's building perm, this building permit thing. I computed the, um, computed, I estimated the spectrum for building permits. I'll tell you how I did that in a few minutes. It was really quite simple, right? What I did was I estimated an AR model and then figured out what the spectrum of the implied AR model was. Okay? And so that's, we'll call that an autoregressive spectral estimator later on, right? Or later on, we'll, we'll, be, we'll call it an AR hack. VAR hack is what it's called, right? OK, anyway, this is what, this is what, here's the spectrum of building permits. Um, this has got some kind of cool stuff, right? Here is, it's got some peaks. This is, I, I plotted it in log scale, right? So these peaks are really big, right? And, and where's the first peak? The first peak is around like, a, let's call it 0.1. So omega is equal to 0.1. Period is 2 pi over frequency. 2 pi over 0.1 is like 60, 65. These are months, right? So that's like five, six years or something, right? So this is kind of, maybe that's not 0.1. Maybe it's 0.07 or something. That's the business cycle stuff, right? And then this peak is around 0.5, right? That's 2 pi over 0.5. Let's call it 12. Right? So this is seasonal thing. And as it turns out, these other things are seasonal things too, right? These are frequencies corresponding to periods of, you know, six months, four months, three months, two months, right? Those are the uh, harmonics. So this plot just sort of shows what, well, we could kind of see in the figure. Okay, so here's this, uh, here's this hack thing. Here's this hack thing. Um, I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to do a whole lecture on it, but. Uh, Jim mentioned that I should say something here because it's going to show up in stuff before Wednesday. So it's the spectrum at frequency zero, right? So uh, long run variance, long run infinite period, right, frequency zero. So here's our formula for the spectrum at any frequency. Stick in omega is equal to zero, e to the zero is one. So I get 1 over 2 pi, sum of all of the autocovariances, OK? So why is that interesting, right? Why is that going to be interesting to us for inference? Well, you know, <laughs> OK, here's my first typo. Suppose I have a bunch of random variables w, and I compute the sample. Oh, no, no. No, OK, this isn't bad. This isn't wrong. This is what I wanted to write. OK. This isn't a typo. It's just bad notation. OK, so here's my model. For those of you in the back, I'll write large. OK, so here's a simple model. Y is mu plus W. OK, so W is a mean 0 stochastic process, right? And I want to estimate the mean of y, right? So I compute the sample mean of y. OK, so that's what must be what this is. 
So of course, right, the sample mean of y minus the true mean, right, is going to be the average of the w's, right, scaled appropriately by the square root of t. That's 1 over the square root of t times the sum of the w's, right? And this is what we would typically, right, apply a central limit theorem to, right? And we would construct a standard error and construct a confidence interval for the mean in the usual way, right? Well, now, let's think about what the variance of this thing is, right? That's going to be our variance that we use in our asymptotic normal approximation to the sampling distribution of this, right? We'll just work out, and we'll do this again later, work out what the variance of this is, right? It's the variance of a sum. The variance of a sum is the sum of the variances plus all of the covariances, right? All of the covariances here are just the auto covariances, right? So this guy turns out to be blah, 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 right? Which is blah, 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 rewritten, right? So this is the sum of all of the autocovariances between minus t plus 1 and t minus 1 plus some little junk, right? And this little junk is, goes, is small, right? So this guy is basically this, right? So now suppose the sample size t gets large. As t gets large, this is just the sum, right, as j goes from minus infinity to infinity. That's just this right, multiplied by 2 pi, right? So this guy is going to be basically 2 pi times f sub 0. So this thing is sometimes called the long run variance, okay? And sometimes there's a 2 pi there and sometimes there isn't, right? But so the jargon of long run variance is people are interested in this, right? And then they give it this spectral interpretation. So now let's, um, now let's go through things um, a little bit more deliberately. OK, so, so now I want to study um, properties of uh, filters. OK, so, so here's the, here's the thing. OK, so, so these are called uh, filters. They're really just moving averages. Okay. And, and so x is going to be a moving average of y, right? So it's an average of future y's and past y's. This L to the minus thing, L is the lag operator, so L inverse is the forward operator. We're moving something forward in time, right? L moves it back. So, you know, so sometimes old guys used, used, used to use B and F, right? B for back, F for forward. Right? That's what I, when I learned this, Clive Granger said B and F, because he said he always got confused with L could be lag or lead. Right? So he used B and F. Right? I mean, that's a fine thing. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Okay? So, but now just L to the minus R means moved forward R periods. Okay? Um, and so this is just the moving average of Y. Okay, now how are we going to interpret this? Okay. So we're going to interpret this um, in, in it, this is called a filter, okay? And it's called a filter because it does something kind of like what you know iTunes does, right? So iTunes, you know, you're listening to music, right? And you you click somewhere, like over here, over here, you click down here someplace in iTunes, right? And it brings up that little um, thing with it's got those fake knobs that you can move up and down, right? So you can turn up the bass, right? And turn down the treble, turn down different frequencies, right? And you can click on what kind of music you're listening to, right? And when you click on the different kind of music you're listening to, right? What does it do? It amplifies certain frequencies, like it amplifies the bass, right? And attenuates other frequencies, okay? So it turns up the volume on certain instruments, Right, and turns down the volume on other instruments. Okay. So that's what, as it turns out, that's what this C of L thing is going to do. It's going to turn up the volume on certain frequencies and turn down the volume on other frequencies. Okay. And so what we want to do is figure out how does it do that, or, or why can we think of it in that way. right? And then importantly, we're going to ask, 
gee, suppose we wanted a little iTunes thing that turned up the volume on business cycles and turned down the volumes on seasonals. How could we cook our filter weights to do that? Okay, so, so that's what we're doing. Okay, so, so these are just linear moving averages, our familiar things, right? We're going to interpret them as filters because they're like filtering sound. Okay, so what I want to do is ask if y, right, what's y, right? Remember, right, y is a sum of a bunch of sines and cosines, right? That's what the spectral representation was, right? y is this building permit series, right? It's got seasonals in it and business cycle stuff in it and stuff, okay? And now what we're going to do, well, we're going to take y and we're going to do something to it. We're going to pass it through this filter, take this moving average of it, and we're going to get x, right? x might be the first difference of y or the seasonal difference of y or something, right? Two examples of filters, right? And I want to ask, what does C of L do to the cyclical, these uh, cyclical properties of y? So let's just look, let's go back to our original example, right? And let's just think about one of the components of y, the omega, right? So cosine of omega t, right? Y is really a bunch of these for different omegas, but let's do them one at a time, right? So let's just do the first one. Okay, so again, I hate cosines, right? So, I'm, so I have to write this as a complex exponential, okay, just because of my learning disability and um, learning difference. Um, that's, I, I didn't mean to be funny there, actually. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to um, write this. I'm going to put a 2 in front of it so I can write it as e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t. So the sine terms disappear, and I got two cosines. It's just going to make life easy. Okay. And so this is a strictly periodic process with period 2 pi over omega. OK, so now I want to take y. I'm going to stick it in here. I want to construct its moving average. And I'm going to look at x. x is also going to be some like weighted average of cosine of omega t. It's going to be strictly periodic, right? Because y is strictly periodic. But it's going to be. Well, obviously, it's going to be shifted in time, right? Because I got this moving average stuff going on. So it's going to be shifted backward or forward or something, right? And these A weight, these C weights, they're not all ones and stuff. So it's going to be squished or amplified. OK? So, so that, that's what we want to figure out. How much is it shifted in time? And how much is it attenuated or amplified? OK. And you have these slides in front of you now? Ah, right. OK. OK. OK, so your page numbers may be different because I changed this. Do you have a page that looks something like this? OK, OK. OK, so now here's the, here's the thing. OK, so now this is just algebra, just for a couple lines of algebra. OK? So it, and they're really, they're really neat. OK. So x is a moving average of y. OK. What's y? y t, remember, y t is e to the i omega t, right? So y t minus j is e to the i omega times t minus j, right? So take y t minus j is e to the i omega t minus j, e to the minus i t minus j, OK? So, so now just rearrange this, OK? Now, a couple of things. So when you rearrange this, this is what you see. You've got this is a summation over j, right? So I've got e to the i omega t. That first little bit doesn't depend on j, right? So this little e to the i omega t bit right there, I could pull that out in front, right? Similarly, over here, I've got e to the minus i omega t. I could pull that bit out in front. Right? And that's what this does. Whoops, that's what this does. This pulls the e to the i omega t out in front. This pulls the e to the minus i omega t out in front. 
Okay? Now, this is what's really nice about this, right? What was y? y is e to the i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t. So these little bits in front, that's y, right? And then there are these moving average weights, these c's, right? What are the moving average weights? Well, they're these sums, right? So we've taken this you know, c of l times y t. We've sort of broken it up in a way that's convenient. Here's y, and here are these weights. OK, now I've used some funny notation here, some notation that just so we're together on this. Here's an green is never good. Here's an example of a C of L. Right, so that's an example, right? L times C1 plus L squared times C2, okay? So then that sum, this first sum right here, right, what would that be? That would be C1 times E to the, what is it? Minus I omega 1 plus C2 E to the minus I omega 2. Right, that's what that first sum would be. Okay, now notice, right, that this is just the same as this if I replaced L with e to the minus i omega. Because then I get e to the minus i omega to the one-th power, e to the minus i omega to the two-th power, right? So this number, whatever this number is, I could write it just like this, only instead of putting an L there, I could just stick in that. Okay, so this is just a number, right, represented by that sum, and it just so happens it's a convenient, I have a convenient little notational device for it, right, which is given by this moving average. Okay, so that's what this is. Okay, so now I'm going to do this. Okay, this number, okay, so, so now I'm going to do something. Again, it's, uh, okay, so now it's, uh, again, a kind of, kind of arithmetic here. Um, this is, because I introduced this complex exponential, this number, it's got an i in it, so it's a complex number. Okay, so is this is the way I'm going to write this complex number. Okay, complex numbers, I'll write it like here. This is a complex number. So how, how do you write complex numbers? A bunch of ways to write them. Here's one way to write them. Real part plus complex part. Okay, so that's, right? Here's another way to write them. Right, another way to write them is to, you remember this from something, right? You put the real part down here, and you put the imaginary part here, right? And then this is just some point in this plane, right? So this is like the A part, and this is the B part, and then it's like a point, point, not a line. It's like a point, right? Where, you know, that's like A, and that's like B, right? Okay, so that's another way to write it, okay? Now, I just have this point in here, right? So another way to represent this is what? Well, I could write it as... I could write it as, well, like, uh, I don't know, Pythagoras or something, right? I could write it like it's how long this green line is, right? I'm going to call the length of this guy G, right, times the, um, uh, and, and, I'm gonna, and, and then I have to tell you what that angle is, theta, right? So I could also write this guy you know, in polar form, right, like this, g times e to the i theta, right? Where what's theta, right? Theta is the angle whose tangent is b over a, 
Okay, this is all going to be important. I know it seems like complete, but it's going to be useful. Okay, so theta is the inverse tangent of b over a, and what's g? g is the length of this thing, right? So that's the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Okay, now, so now this is great because see that number right there, I'm going to write like this. This, so this number, I'm going to write like this. This number is the same number but with a minus i, so I'm going to write it like this as well and put a little minus i in front of it. Okay? That's what this is. Okay, now, as it turns out, okay, now next, next, okay, now rearrange. Boom. See, this is the complex exponentials, or really now there are friends, right? Now there are friends, because I know how to like multiply them and stuff, right? So going from here to here is easy, it's just g. It's, it's just this, right? So, so that's just, that's easy now. And now I'll, I'll undo the complex exponential. This is just, I'll put it, write it back in cosine form, okay? Now remember what was y? y was 2 sine 2, pff, y was 2 times cosine omega t. So what have we done to y? Well, we've done two things to it. We shifted it back in time, right? We shifted it back in time by how many time periods? Theta over omega. What was theta? Theta is the angle, right, whose tangent is b over a, okay? And we multiplied it times some number g, right? What was g? g is the absolute value of this thing. It's how big c is. Okay, so we've taken this moving average filter and we've said it does two things. It attenuates this or amplifies it. That's this G thing and it shifts it in time, right? And what this does is give you a convenient formula to figure out what G, the attenuation factor is, and what the shift in time is. So this G is sometimes called the gain of this filter and this theta is sometimes called the phase or phase shift. Okay, now we did this, of course, for one omega, right? Business cycle. So this thing, you know, changed the business cycle by g and shifted it back in time by theta. If we did this for another cyclical component, like the seasonal, right, we go through the same calculation. But now, the g and theta would be different, right? Because this number is different, right? So I should really write g of omega and theta of omega, right? So I have a gain function and a phase function. Okay. So what I want to do now is look at these for a couple of filters, okay? Look at these for a couple of filters, okay. So that was, okay, so I'm going to stop for a second. So that was hard. Not hard, it was algebra, you had to do algebra. That's always hard, okay? So, so now let's do, let's look at one of these. This is example one, okay? So let's suppose you just arrived to this thing late and really hung over, okay? And someone said, here's my filter. What does it do to Y? you'd say it shifts it back in time by two periods. And that's it, right? So, you know, as an algebra check, we better make sure that this filter shifts it back in time by two periods. So sure enough, the gain turns out to be one, right? And it shifts it back in time by two periods. Great. Here's something a little bit more complicated. This is from Sargent's old textbook. This is, like, this is like the greatest part of this textbook. 
Okay? This is why this textbook is famous. Right? It's because of his small kid of E to the I omegas. Right? Those of you that have read this, right? That's the really nice bit. Okay? So he's got in there, he, he's got um, this gain and phase calculation for the, you know, what he calls the Kuznets filter, right? Which is a, a filter that Simon Kuznets applied to some annual data, right? And the filter he applied to some annual data, he was interested in um, doing two things to his data. Number one, I, I kind of have these in reverse order, but he was interested in eliminating some trends, right? So what he did is look at, at sort of centered decadal average differences, right? So he looked at, I'll recall this B of L, L minus 5 minus L to the fifth. So that's like YT plus 5 minus YT minus 5. So that's a 10-year difference. So looked at 10-year differences, right, to get rid of trends, okay? And then when he did that, the series was kind of choppy, right? So he said, oh, you know, let me construct some simple moving averages, five-year moving averages of these decadal differences, okay? All kind of reasonable things, get rid of trends, smooth out some stuff, right? So what's the filter he applied to the data? Well, C of L times B of L, A of L, right? Just apply both of these things, right? So we can compute the gain and phase of these filters, right? Um, I'm not going to show you the phase, right? It's, um, and the gain is easy to compute, right? If I take something and multiply it times 2, and then I take that thing and multiply it times 6, at the end of the day, I've multiplied it times 2 times 6 or 12. So the gain of C of L is the gain of B times the gain of A, right? Gains multiply, okay? So I can compute the gain of this and the gain of this, right? And you could just do that, right? That's just these simple little calculations. So you could do that in Excel or something, right? Just compute these numbers and in the usual way, right? So I did that here, right? And um, I did that here. And here's what the gain looks like. And again, this must be in Sargent's textbook, but I, I, I didn't. It must be there, okay? And it's really nice. It's really nice. No, no, what did it do? It eliminated low frequencies. It got rid of the trend, right? That's what he wanted it to do, right? It, here these, num these numbers go from zero to two, right? It attenuated high frequencies, right? The average height there is about 0.2. So it attenuated high frequencies. That's what he wanted it to do. But what did it do? Well, it amplified, right, something with frequency of around, oh, 0.3, right? So 0.3 corresponds to about 20 years. So what did he do? He like took iTunes, right, and turned up the volume on 20-year cycles. So if you do that, if you take iTunes and you turn up the volume really loud on the drums, right, what do you hear when you play a song? The drums, right? So what did Kuznets see when he looked at data filtered like this? he saw Kuznet cycles, right, 20-year cycles. Now, that wasn't because they were 20-year cycles in the data. It's because he turned up the volume on the drums, right? So just as an example, right, here's white noise. Process it. Pass it through this filter, right? Take these data, process it, and what do you get? You get that, right? So you've just... Well, you just did what, you know, we did what you did, okay? So this is kind of like, one interpretation of this is like, it's like you messed up, right? You did something that sort of seemed sensible, and then you got this, and then, you know, you said the drums are loud, right? Because the drums are loud, okay? So, so that, that arguably is a mistake. Um, 
here, here's some other guys that did some stuff. And the other guys that did some stuff were, uh, I got to look at my time. Yeah, we're fine. The other guys that did some stuff, this is like uh, Julius Shishkin. So he was, uh, he was at um, like the BLS or something in the early 60s. And, um, you know, so the story is in those days, um, seasonal uh, adjustment was like a job description. You know, you, you could have a job as a seasonal adjustor, right? That was your, and you went to work every day and you seasonally adjusted things and you did it, you know, you did it by things were sort of plotted and, you know, you drew lines and you seasonally adjusted things by hand, right? And he thought, gee, I could, maybe I could train a machine to do what these guys are doing, right? So I could throw these guys out of work, right? And that would be a good thing, right? So. <laughs> Right, so he said, you know, let me write a computer program that mimics what these guys do, right? So he wrote a series of computer programs, experimental programs, X1, X2, blah, 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 right? And um, I'm going to show you what X11, we still keep this X numbers, right? Um, X11, we now have X12 or X13 or something. They're basically X11 with some bells and whistles I'll talk about in a few minutes because it solves the one-sided output gap problem, okay? But here's, here's the steps, okay? You can't, you're not supposed to be able to read this, okay? But it's like, you know, Kuznets gone crazy, right? <laughs> it's first you do this, and then 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 you do that, and this, uh, 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 right? And here's got eight steps, right? And this is an approximation. They're really more, okay? But blah, 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 okay. Now, you know, and how did he come up with this? He just came up with this just, you know, I just kind of tried it on a bunch of stuff, you know, would compare his results to what a seasonal adjuster was really doing, you know, one of these experts, seeing if he was getting kind of the same numbers, right? So by trial and error, sort of came up with this, this scheme. Okay, well, what was the gain? What, so this is all linear filters. So what's the gain of this? I mean, holy moly, right? This is so cool, right? Because what did he do? Well, he invented something that basically passed. Here's a gain of one. Left the volume unchanged on those frequencies turn the volume way down at the seasonals. So by careful work here, sort of by chance, if you will, he figured out a filter that did really just what you want to do, what he wanted to do. OK, so that's great. OK, so now you might say, you know, we know if you do this filtering, you can get it wrong. You can get it wrong, or you can get it right, right? Maybe we can be kind of smart and figure out how can we get it right and not wrong, right? So, oh, here's the HP filter. Here's the HP filter. It, this, you probably don't have this in your slides, but it just, it's a, right? It's, you guys know it better than I do, probably. It's a, it eliminates trends. So, so it kind of does, kind of sounds, does what it does, right? That's pretty good. Okay. Oh, spectra, shucks. Oh, man. I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta go ahead here. I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna come back to this, because I, I gotta, we're rolling here. Okay. So I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna come back to this stuff. Okay, so now what we're going to do is, is let's, suppose, let's suppose we want to construct a filter which keeps certain frequencies. Frequencies between, here I'll write them as frequencies, you know, uh, let's try and keep t the trend just for fun. Let's do solve that problem. Let's try and keep the trend. So let's keep all frequencies between, um, zero and omega lower bar. And let's turn down the volume on everything else. So really, let's listen to the drums, right, and eliminate all of the other instruments. 
Right? So this is an example of what would be called a bandpass filter. You want to pass a certain band of frequencies, the drums, low frequency stuff. Okay? So what, and what do we want to do? Well, we want to cook a, a filter that does that. So we want a C of L right, that gives us this. Right? So how do we do that? Well, um, I think I say, gee, you want the gain, you want the phase to be zero. If you want the phase to be zero, that says you don't shift it in time. That must be you treat the future the same way you treat the past. So on average, you haven't shifted it in time. So this is going to be a symmetric filter, symmetric around zero. So you haven't introduced a time shift. Okay. And then what do you want to do? Well, I want the uh, gain of this filter to be 1 over certain frequencies from 0 to omega lower bar to be 1 there and 0 every place else, right? So I want some, you know, gain function that looks like that, right? OK. So how do you do that? Well, you know, it turns out to be quite straightforward. Right? And I'm not going to go through the details of the slide, but you know, you write out what the Fourier transform of this filter. It's just this, these are these this sum that we saw before. It's just that number over there, right? And then you do a little calculation and you convince yourself that this is an identity and where that's the gain. And, and then you stick in one right there, and then you do the integration, and boom, out pop your C weights. Okay, so it's just straightforward. OK, now, so here they are. Here they are. OK. So um, and remember, this guy's symmetric. So it's got future values and lagged values. OK, now, a couple of things about these C weights. Here's what they are, C sub j, the weight that you put on the lag of the series j periods ago or the lead of the series j periods in the future, right, is given by this. It's proportional to 1 over j. So it's declining, right? But it's declining kind of slowly, right? So we're talking about one-sided things. We're going to worry about that. Future data might be pretty important, right? Um, that's what this says. This says, oh, oh. So this says, this is I got the low frequency. Suppose I wanted to get everything except the low frequency. What would I do? Well, I'd take the original series, subtract this, right? So that would give me a high pass filter. This is a low pass filter. What if I wanted just the business cycles, right? Well, I could low pass here and low pass here and then subtract, right? So by subtracting rectangles, I can get any rectangle I want, OK? So that's what this is. OK, this is, a, this is a thing from this Baxter and King thing. Apparently, they wrote it in year 199. <laughs> Mary Ann doesn't look that old. Bob is starting to look, uh, look a little old. But uh, um, uh, OK, what they showed is, right, so in general, you want an infinite number of leads and lags. What they showed is that if you wanted to approximate the gain function in an in an L2, the best L2 approximation of the gain function, where you're going to truncate this over a certain number of periods, then it turns out you can just truncate. But I don't think that's an interesting calculation for reasons I'll talk about in just a second. OK, here's the, um, here's the um, suppose I want to pass um, periods less than eight years. I don't know if that's right. Periods less than eight years. Yeah, so this is a gap filter, right? A gap filter, right? Periods higher than eight years are trends, right? Periods less than eight years I might think of as deviations from trends. So this is, I want to compute a gap, an output gap or something, right? These are monthly data. So I'm going to apply this to the index of industrial production in a minute. Okay. One thing you can see is, well, you want to put a lot of weight on you know, the contemporaneous value. But you know, even after these weights are dying out, but they're not dying out real fast, right? 
So even like way out here, this is like 600. That's like 50 years. Oh, man, right? There's still something non-trivial there. So if I was doing something real time, right, if I just truncated here, right, I like committed a sin, right, in, in, like a big sin, pretty big sin, scheme of sins, I don't know, but, you know, not something you'd be proud of. Okay. Um, okay. So, so, okay, so here's something I did, okay, just so you see this, okay. So I apply, okay, this is a log of real GDP. Here's the series. It only goes up to 2004 or something because this is an old plot. Okay, and here I just did some bandpass filtering. The question about what I did at the end, I'll tell you in a second, right? So here's the low frequency bit. Here's the business cycle frequency bit. Here's the high frequency bit. This is kind of what you would expect to see. One thing that's interesting here is what does the high frequency bit look like? High frequencies. What does the trend look like? Trend. What does the business cycle look like? Business cycle, right? So it, it wouldn't be interesting to look at this and say, you know what, this kind of appears to repeat itself every six or seven or eight years, right? Be because it's cooked like that, right? I turned up the volume on those frequencies. So that kind of has to happen, right? It's kind of interesting, of course, that you see this volatility decline here very clearly, right? Of course, why? Because it's got a lot of high frequency action in it, so you're going to see a lot of repetitions of that. Okay. Now, here's, the, here's, a, here's where I wanted to go. Okay, now this, okay, so I have to take a breath. This is important. Okay, so now, let's suppose, you know, it's 2008, and I want to construct the output gap in 2008. Well, if I was lucky, I'm sorry, or if I, I'm not lucky. If I could see into the future perfectly well, I could put data, I'd be able to, con in my mind, I would know what GDP data is going to be like for the next 50 years, right? So I could do it, right? I just put in GDP data in the future, okay? So that would be, if you will, the infeasible estimate of the output gap today. Well, what should I do if I don't know the future value of GDP to stick into this? Let me now construct my best guess of the output gap today conditional on information that I have today. Well, this is just beautiful, simple, linear model, right? It doesn't get any different, it doesn't get any easier than this. If I want to construct my best guess of this, get a minimum mean square error estimate of x, I just do it one element at a time. I get my, stick in my best guess of, well, this has current and lag values of y in it. I know those. My best guess of current and lag values of y are the actual current and lag values of y. My best guess of future values of y, I don't know what those are, so I forecast them, right? So what do I do? I apply this filter the optimal two-sided filter to a time series where I've padded out the future post-sample periods and maybe pre-sample periods with forecasts and backcasts. Okay? And that's the best thing to do. Now, John Gavicki talked about this in the context of seasonal adjustment. So this is what you know, X12 ARIMA does. X12 ARIMA is just X11 you know, but applied to the series with forecast and backcast appended where they use ARIMA models to do that. You know, here we might use ARIMA models, we might use vector autoregressions, we might use, I don't know, DSG models, anything, right, to stick in forecast and backcast. There's a paper by Larry Cristiano and Terry Fitzgerald that approaches this in a, I say an alternative approach. I had originally written here in a comma more complicated and less general approach. But anyway, that was a little snide, so I didn't want to include that. So <laughs> don't tell him I said that. I actually saw Larry last week, and I told him I was going to say that, because I didn't like that paper. Anyway, maybe you noticed. Uh, uh, why? Because John did this in 1978 in a great way. OK, so that's this. OK, so now, and you could compute 
I got one minute left. Um, uh, I got one minute left. Darn. Uh, and then you could compute, right, um, how uncertain am I? How uncertain am I about my output gap today, right? What are the errors, right, in my output gap? Well, it's the fact that you know I replaced actual future values with forecasts, right? And I know from the VAR, the D, or the stochastic process that I use to do the forecasting, I know how big those forecast errors are likely to be on average. I know what their variance and covariance properties are. So I can compute the variance of my output gap in real time. Okay? So here's just a calculation that does that. Right? So this is, um, this is like uh, IP, Index of Industrial Production. Right? Here is the, um, here's the actual series with the trend. Here's the output gap computed in this way, I, just, just the way I said. Right? So in the middle here, I had future data and past data. At the ends, I didn't. Right? So out here, I don't have future values, but I have a bunch of past values. Here, I have future values, but not a bunch of past values. Right? So that's my best guess of this optimal two-sided thing. Here's the standard error of this, right? which I could compute in a straightforward way. I know properties of forecast errors. I know properties of backcast errors, smoosh them around in the right way and compute the standard errors. And you can see, you know, you get the result here that you would expect, right, that if I'm computing this output gap in real time, it's got a standard deviation of about two and a half, right, percentage points at an annual rate, right? So that's, that's pretty big. So I don't know very much about what's going on there for, for reasons that we all understand, okay? Now, I'm out of time. Here's some other stuff you can just look at on your own. Um, here are these um, standard errors for real-time, one-sided gaps. Um, for industrial production, I guess the number was two. For the unemployment rate, it's about um, a half of a percentage point. For real GDP, it's about one. These are constructed using forecasts that I constructed from simple autoregressions. You might ask, could I do better, right? Since I'm sticking in forecasts, if I can forecast better, I can get more accurate estimates of gaps, right? So you could say, well, what if I used a VAR and stuck in a bunch of good stuff, right? And you can do a little better, but not very much. OK, so I'm out of time. So I'm in, out of time and that we need a break. So let's take a break. And then um, when we come back, there's a couple of bits here I need to highlight before we go on to the next lecture. OK, good. So let's get some coffee. We're there, there are a couple of things I want to finish in, in this lecture before we move on. Um, the first one is quite important conceptually. The second one is a formula that we'll use a bunch. OK, so um, let's do the first one first, right, which is this conceptual issue. And uh, you know, here it is. OK, so this is going to say, this is going to sound dumb or obvious or something, but, and maybe it is. But he, he, here's, what, here's what I have in mind. OK, so, so here's your, here's your you know, run-of-the-mill regression um, written in the notation of um, any good undergraduate textbook. Um, so you, regress, you want to regress y on x, and um, x and u are uncorrelated. And uh, you know, so you know, that's it, right? That's what, uh, that's what you need for like least squares to be good in all of the, OK, not good. Well, good, not great, right? Good in, in all of the usual ways, right? So you get a consistent estimator and you do blah, 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 right? But if you don't have this, you know, you're dead, right? Or what you've done is you've done something silly. OK, now, so, you know, the you know, question arises, gee, well, what if, I, um, what if I think about estimating this relationship, but instead of using y's and x's, I use 
filtered y's and x's. I HP filter things, or I first difference things, or I seasonally adjust things, or I do any of a number of other things, right? How's that going to change the regression? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What are the pluses and minuses? Okay. Um, the pluses are a little subtle. The minuses are really obvious. Okay, so let me just, let's just talk through the minuses. Okay, so, you know, y is, uh, I'm sorry, y filtered is filtered y, x filtered is filtered x, and notice I use the same filter on both of them. Okay, so, so um, you know, so what have I done? I've taken this, this equation, filtered y, filtered x, and, you know, filtered u, and I'm going to have the same beta. Okay, so that first thing's first. I haven't sort of, if you will, changed the definition of beta here, okay, or, or have I, right? Now, right, if I'm going to run this regression, what do I need? Well, I need the regressor and the error term to be uncorrelated with one another, right? And I guess this kind of looks like that, except it's got superscripts. So you kind of feel good, but you know, you can't just do that, right? <laughs> that this requires, right, x, has, x filtered has lagged current future x's in it, u filtered has lagged current future u's in it, right? So for this to be true in general, it's got to be the case that x and u are uncorrelated at all leads and lags. At all leads and lags. When is that going to happen? Never, ever, 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 ever. <laughs> right? Ever. Can I think of an example? No, never. Right? I mean, it's ha very hard to think about a model where, you know, I don't know, the buzz, you know, strict exogenate or whatever the buzzwords are you want to use, right? That, you know, X and U are going to be uncorrelated all leads and lags. So, right, in general, you know, I mean, this is just, you know, sort of econometrics 101 kind of reasoning, you know, you always tell students, you know, first thing you do when you write down a regression is you ask, is X and U uncorrelated? If X and U are uncorrelated, you know, then go to step two. If it's not, start over, right? Here you started in the right place, but then this messes it up, okay? So this is very dangerous, right? Is it going to work? Well, it can, I mean, it depends on the filter. It depends on the model. And, you know, you could imagine writing down situations in which this might hold, right? But in general, it's not. So you have to think about it very carefully. Of course, in general, that's not going to hold either, right? I mean, you kind of have to think about that. Okay. Now, this is, you know, just to make sure we're on the same page, right? This is sort of exactly the same reasoning or the same argument, right, that people make, you know, if you've got this sort of, you know, run-of-the-mill regression model, and you think your error term is serially correlated, it's an AR1, right? And in the olden days, we learned if you had an AR1 error, you should correct for serial correlation, right? And then someone said, but wait a minute, that's just applying a filter to both sides, and that changes the orthogonality conditions that you're assuming, right? And so what did we learn? Well, we learned that correcting for AR1 errors or any other kind of time series errors might really mess you up, right? So people don't do that anymore. They use hack standard errors in general. Why? Because they're really worried, right? So, so this is just the same thing, right? So I guess the thing is, if you're going to use filter data, think really hard. And if you're going to do GLS, think really hard. Okay, so, so anyway, okay, so that's the sort of c conceptual point, okay? So I just wanted to say that. Again, nothing, it, this is obvious, but um, needed to be said. Okay, so, uh, so, so this obviously over here, this is supposed to be a Y over here, and that's, that's an X. Okay, so, um, so this is going back, this is called page 38 here. I don't know what page it is for you guys. It's, um, 
it's it's around uh, it's around this H it's around this X11 thing, right? Probably the page after the Alexa. 33. 33. Okay. So so here's just some notation. Okay. So this is what we know. You know, if I take y, this should be y, and I filter it by c of l, and I get x, right? What have I done? I have taken y, the omega component of y, and kind of multiplied it times g by this gain thing, right? If g is less than 1, I squished it. I attenuated. If g is bigger than 1, I amplified it, OK? And maybe I shifted it in time, too, by this phase, but let's forget about that. OK. So now, right? Um, what I want to do is ask, you know, uh, if I know the spectrum of y, so think about the spectrum as the variance of y, you know, if I know the variance of y and I multiply y times 2, what's the variance of x? Well, it's 4 times the variance of y, right? So it's the same thing here. If I know the variance of y, and x is equal to something times y, the variance of x is going to be that constant squared times the variance of y. Okay? So that's what this little formula says. The variance of x is the constant squared times the variance of y. Now the constant squared turns out to be something you can write like this. right? It's this filter times itself. Okay? So this is just the constant squared. Okay. Now why is that useful? That's useful, well, it's useful for lots of things, but it's particularly useful because it allows us to compute the spectra of like ARMA models, right, in, very, in a ver very simple formula. This is going to be useful because when we do hack standard errors, they're estimates of the spectrum, and sometimes we're going to do that by estimating an AR model and then figure out what the implied spectrum is. Okay? So that's why this formula is useful. Okay? So we're going to do this, right? So now what do I have? I've got a series epsilon, which is white noise, and Y is a filtered version of that. right? So I can figure out the spectrum of Y as what G squared times the spectrum of epsilon. What's the spectrum of epsilon? Well, here's the general formula for the spectrum, right? But epsilon is this white noise guy, so all that junk goes away, right? So the spectrum of epsilon is just this constant, OK? So that says if I want to compute the spectrum of these armor things, I compute, well, here's g squared times a constant, right? g squared can be written as well, c of l, c of e to the i omega, c of e to the minus i omega, but it's just, right, that's g squared. That's the formula. Okay? Now, let's look at the formula a little bit more deeply because we're going to have to plug in numbers later, right? So let's look at it a bit more deeply. It's this theta, I erased this thing over here, it's this theta evaluated e to the i omega, theta evaluated e to the minus i omega. So what is this? This is just theta of L, where wherever there was an L, I put in an e to the i omega or an e to the minus i omega, divided by phi of L, but now evaluate e to the i omega. So I put that down there. Okay? So in particular, you know, if I'm interested in the spectrum at frequency 0, this is what we're going to need, spectrum at frequency 0, I put in omega is equal to 0. Now, e, all of these e things are e to the zeros. Those are all ones. So this is 1 minus phi 1 dot 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 minus phi q times itself divided by 1 minus phi 1 dot 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 minus phi, that should be a p, um, times itself. Right? So that's a simple formula for figuring out the long run variance, um, the long run variance of this uh, process. OK, so that's a formula that we're going to need. OK. And then, what else did I do? I didn't do this, and I'm not going to do it. OK, this is, again, I did everything for scalars. You know, you can make things vectors. OK, so just work through this on your own, or, or don't. Do what you want, right? And again, now we have a spectral, you know, you have instead of a variance, you have a covariance matrix. So instead of a spectrum, you have a spectral, instead of a spectral density, you have a spectral density matrix. 
And in the off diagonals, you have these things like covariances. They're covariances between the z increments. Okay, and you can just read this. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Spectral estimation, I'm going to come back to this later. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. Okay? Okay, so that's the end of lecture one.